afternoon. Thank you for joining us um, on such a lovely summer's day. We're all sitting in a dark room. But um, you're, thank you for supporting this event and, and joining us. Uh, I'm Colin Thorpott, I'm a member of the university's court. It sounds like I sort of sit in judgment on people who behave badly. It's not that at all. It's a sort of advisory body for the university. Uh, and I'm uh, hosting this event. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers and our subject, which is a German-Greek relations, a turbulent entanglement. Now, I suppose we're all quite familiar, aren't we, with discussions about relationships between Britain and other specific countries. I mean, Britain and Germany is a good example, isn't it, of a, a sort of cross-national bilateral relationship which has had all sorts of influences over the years, usually to do either with war or football. Um, uh, and, um, but of course, all bilateral national relationships, not necessarily ones involving Britain, Personally, I find very fascinating, and they're all very different. They're all um, different, and often subject to all sorts of myths and stereotypes as well, of course. Um, but I do think this one that we're going to discuss today is a particularly fascinating one the relationship between Germany and Greece. And I suppose it, it probably came into prominence, didn't it, a few years ago during the Euro financial crisis, when, you know, in the sort of tabloid press way of looking at it, um, Greece, you know, the poor man of Europe was being bailed out by you know, the super rich Germans. I mean, that's a gross oversimplification of what happened, but you know, that's the way it was. And there was lots of, I think it's best to say, vitriol flying between Athens and Berlin during that time. And, and lots of um, views and many misconceptions on the part of Greeks and Germans about each other. Um, so that's the subject today. But of course, the relationship between uh, these two countries, Germany and Greece, uh, is, goes back a lot, long further than Euro financial crisis of whenever it was a few years ago. Um, and to elucidate all this for us today, we're joined by uh, two people who actually know something about it in a great deal more detail than, than I do. Um, and they are Kelly Pazmatsi, um, who is currently uh, Assistant Professor in Translation Studies and Research Director of the Humanities Department of the, the City College, University of New York, Europe campus. I had to check where that was. It's in Thessaloniki, isn't it? Yeah, not in York. Um, and it's one of the, I suppose this is a fair way to describe it, outposts, if you like, of the <laughs> University of York elsewhere in the world. There are, I think, some others as well. Um, and um, Kelly's particular research interests lie in sociological approaches to translation, literary translation, and cultural production. And she's been involved since 2016 with the journal New Voices in Translation Studies. Um, and also involved in that, as the co-editor, I think, um, is our other speaker, David Charleston, who's an independent researcher, teacher, and translator, and as I say, co-editor of New Voices in Translation. Um, and he's written two books, I'm not going to list them now, he may do so himself, um, which are specifically about different aspects of German um, history. Uh, and the other thing you need to know about these two people is that they are collaborating together to write a book uh, about the very subject we're going to be talking about today, so they, they are actively working together on this subject. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for your questions and contributions later, but let's hand over to um, Kelly and to David. Thank you. To so is this? Yeah, this is on. So I, I would like to welcome you to this presentation. Um, so what we'd like to do today is to give you a brief historical overview of German-Greek cultural entanglements with an emphasis on how Greek antiquity shaped uh, 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 German culture and how the German construct of, uh, of Greece shaped uh, Greeks' self-perception to a great extent. Then drawing on Bourdieu's sociology, um, we seek to illuminate the place of modern Greece uh, in uh, German letters and to show how a relationship of uh, love and hate uh, and uh, often conflict might look like in the literary field. Um, so in our, in our introductory section, uh, we are going to uh, try to explain some of the more provocative images um, that made headlines during the financial crisis of 2010, um, which, uh, which revealed German-Greek uh, relationship as a turbulent uh, one. Um, and uh, the, uh, the relationship being one of uh, uh, long-standing 
and uh, complex, sometimes conflict. So in the historical background uh, section, uh, we will give you some uh, selected highlights of uh, Greek uh, German cultural entanglements extending back to the 18th century up until uh, the 20th century. With reference to the work of Pierre Bourdieu, we reflect on the cultural dyna dynamics of this relationship uh, that this history gave rise to and the influence these tensions have um, on translation and cultural transfer. And finally, we look at some examples which seem to deviate from Bourdieu's understanding of uh, cross-cultural transfer, uh, mainly focusing on cultural activism and the role of collective practices in, uh, in the re reproduction and production of culture. So David, over to you. Can you hear my microphone? Yeah. Is it actually on? So, um, This deliberately provocative populist image appeared in the German news magazine Focus in, in 2010. The title there, Betrüger in der Eurofamilie, uh, means fraudsters in the Euro family. And the article relates to the debt crisis that we've already mentioned. Greece is accused of cheating Europe, especially Germany, by failing to repay their debt. Uh, but for our analysis that we're going to tell you about, it's also interesting that Greece is rather crudely symbolised here by the classical statue making an anachronistic, aggressive gesture. So the magazine editors, the graphic designers, did much to shape the, uh, the and, and actually to classify this narrative as aggressive. It's the, the media who, who make it aggressive. And um, one direct, equally populist Greek response to the German article was this image here with added swastika and the phrase, the Fourth Reich, in the heading. Once again, it's the media that control the narrative. You can see that the Greek article actually has a photograph of the German article in the top corner. And you can see the word Fourth Reich, if you can read any any Greek alphabet just above the, the picture. So a very provocative and, and aggressive way of, of talking about this relationship. Um, taken together, the two images show the tip of an iceberg, merely suggesting the depth of conflict between the two nations. And against this crudely politicized background, our primary interest is to investigate the extent to which acts of cultural production, so literature, poetry, music, um, can con not only contribute to the conflict, but can also perhaps help to um, bring about a kind of reconciliation uh, at, at some level between the, these two countries. Um, as these two commemorative marvels um, show, the first one is from 1820s and the second from World War II. The entanglement goes back even beyond the, the formation of, of the two nations. Germany didn't really exist as a nation in the, the early part of the 19th century. And Greek, Greece gained independence in the 1820s. So we see a, a memorial to German Philhellenes. You'll hear this word several times uh, in, in the talk. They were people who loved Greek history and the Greeks, who died in the Greek War of Independence. And on the right-hand side, a statue dedicated to Greeks executed by the Germans in 1944. Um, so the, uh, the next several slides, which we're going to turn to now, give a sketchy overview of the historical background based on our own ongoing research for the book that, that Colin just explained, and um, supported by existing research. So we particularly we've looked at uh, a, a very standard book by Roderick Beaton called Greece, a biography. And he looks at the, relate, the history of Greece as if Greece was a, as a person who has ancestors and, and family tree. 
and he looks at different aspects of, of Greece in that way. And also, we've looked at a, a really interesting recent article by Robert Crystal called An Eternal Recurrence. Well, some of you might recognise the phrase eternal recurrence comes in Nietzsche, and it uh, means we're going round and round the same story, this, this idea of, of um, Greek-German love-hate relationship. And so we're going to go through these headings one by one. It just gives you a very quick outline of what happened in, in the history of the relationship between Greece and Germany. Neoclassicism, uh, the Greek War of Independence in the early part of the 19th century. Then Greece has a king, a German king, who's in, more or less invited to come and take over. And then uh, during that time, we have uh, the suppression of Byzantine and Ottoman history. The Germans don't want to know about that. They only want to know about Hellenism. And then there's a, a rather unpleasant twist when we talk about Jakob Philipp Fallmerheyer, uh, whose ideas connect with Hitler. And then with that finally leads us on to modern Greek history, the Greek Civil War, the Junta, and, and uh, the resistance movements. But we'll just touch on those in, in the next few slides. Um, so, we begin the story with, with Winkelmann, Jakob, Jakob Joachim Winkelmann. He was an art historian, um, especially associated with neoclassicism and German Philhellenism. Um, this is the title page from one of his key works, the, the German title, Gedanken über die Nachahmung der griechischen Werke. It means reflections on the imitation of Greek works. And Winkelmann argues in this book that classical art was Greek and that Roman art was a mere copy of, of that. So he introduced this idea then of the original and the copy. And the original is always the Greek. And it strengthens the binary about imitations and copy. And that's quite interesting for us in terms of translation. Everything's a translation from the Greek. And um, so I wanted to just take you through a couple of examples of iconic German Philhellenists or neoclassicists. Um, but let's begin then. Here are some of the iconic cultural producers. They're Germans who produce philosophy or poetry, and they exemplify an ongoing collective process of German selective appropriation from Greek cultural capital over the next two centuries. Their prestige, the fact that we know who these people are, Goethe and, and Nietzsche and Heidegger, very famous names, um, is dependent on their relationship with, with Greek cultural antecedents. Um, so, for example, Goethe's play Iphigenia of Tauvis, 1779, was based on Euripides' play of the same name. Many of Goethe's other works translate creatively, sometimes with incredible imagination, from ancient Greek precedents. For many writers, Kant's Kritik der reinen Vernunft, that's the Critique of Pure Reason, um, it marks the beginning of the European Enlightenment. But of course, really what it was, was Kant interpreting the work of Aristotle and um, Plato. The epistemological questions Kant's book explores are derived from the work of, of these Greek thinkers. But he writes in a uniquely German way. So it's, it's not just a one-way process. The work of the German poet Friedrich Hölderlin, especially the famous Schicksalslied and the epistolic novel which contains that poem, Iperion, 1799, well, that celebrates imagined ancient and modern Greek uh, worlds, but in German verse and, and, and German poetic prose. Contrasting with Kant's epistemology, Hegel's Wissenschaft der Logik, that's the science of logic, his biggest, most important book. Well, it derives its ontology from going back to Kant and looking at Kant through the eyes of Plato and Aristotle. So he reinterprets a German philosopher through Greek eyes and moves German philosophy on uh, 
in, into another phase from epistemology to ontology. So we could actually describe what Hegel does as a systematic transadaptation of, of Greek works. Um, Nietzsche's Genealogie der Morale, means the genealogy of morals, much later in the 19th century, also reevaluates and celebrates the supposed superiority of ancient Greek ethics over 19th century European decadence and hypocrisy. And finally, Heidegger's Sein und Zeit, so it brings us right into the 20th century, being in time opens in, with a Greek quotation and in Greek alphabet, and um, inspired by Plato's The Sophist. Um, and Heidegger suggests that our understanding of being, the Greek word usia, and Heidegger says, well, since Socrates, we understand less and less what being is. So we've got worse and worse since the ancient Greeks. So really an entanglement with, with, with early Greek writers. The Greek-German flow of cultural capital can be seen as having defined um, an evolving international field of cultural production throughout European history. All of those writers have influenced so many other writers and philosophers that we can't really separate from that, that entanglement. Um, just to move on to Nietzsche. Um, for Nietzsche, just to focus on this one example, the ancient Greek gods embodied a balance between animal vitality and rational self-control. The life-affirming ancient Greek civilization antedated what Nietzsche saw as the life-negating aspects of Judeo-Christian morality. Look at the first quotation here, the Greek gods. Um, those reflections of noble and self-controlled man in whom animal in man felt himself first deified and did not tear himself apart, did not rage against himself. These are qualities that Nietzsche thought the Greeks had, but we Europeans, Christians, have lost those, those qualities. We don't have that anymore. The Greeks were not consumed with guilt, bad conscience, or hypocrisy. The second quotation hammers that point home. Throughout the longest period of their history, the Greeks used their gods for no other purpose than to keep bad conscience at bay, to be allowed to enjoy the freedom of their souls. Thus, in a sense, diametrically opposed to that in which Christianity has made use of its God. So the opposite kind of a way of thinking about God. It's important to remember when we're thinking about these German philosophers that they didn't write or work on their own. The construction of German Philhellenism was a collective endeavour involving a network of publishers, patrons and the reading public at, at that time. In a sense, German cultural production superseded but was dependent on the ancient Greek. So um, that's the end of the German flow. I wanted to jump ahead now, to, well jump sideways rather, to the newly uh, emancipated Greek nation. Roderick Beaton is the, the, the main historian that, that we've been looking at, recently published book. And he sees the Greek bid for independence from the Ottoman Empire around the 1820s as basically kindled by the Greeks' um, awareness of the French Revolution 20 years before. Um, but Beaton and Crystal both highlight the way in which the development of the Greek nation was carefully stage managed by the Bavarians and the court of King Otto, the new king of Greece. It's a little bit confusing that the Greeks liberated themselves from the Ottoman Empire and then they got a king whose name was Otto. So it's, they have absolutely nothing to do with each other. But, um, so we go from the Ottoman to the Othonian uh, phase. But um, under Otto, Greece was promoted as the centre of classical culture, Hellenic culture, the Hellenes, and tr any trace of the Byzantine Christian Greek world and the Ottoman occupation of Greece was literally physically eradicated. Um, and, and 
churches, Byzantine churches and Ottoman mosques were actually physically destroyed during this time. Um, Crystal discusses some of the new buildings in early modern Greece, which are a bit deceptive if you go to Greece and look at the buildings, because some of them were actually built by Germans. Um, and the, one of the particular Germans was a Bavarian architect known as Leo von Klintzer, who designed Greek-looking buildings to make Greece look more classical and Hellenic than it, than it really did. But uh, so, um, this involved a huge investment of German capital, economic capital, and human capital. People worked hard to build these buildings, but it, at the same time it destroyed an accumulation of, of Greek capital, Byzantine and, and Ottoman buildings and artefacts, which were just thrown away and destroyed. Um, there's an oil painting of King Otto arriving in Athens. He didn't arrive immediately after the War of Independence. It was several years later. And then this painting was, was made eight, nine years later by, by a Bavarian, I think he was a Bavarian artist, Peter von Hess. Very stylized, rather unrealistic oil painting. The Acropolis towers over the scene as a reminder of ancient Hellenism. Um, the arrival of the foreign king was also stage managed by groups of, of Greek and German officials who stood to gain from, from having a, a new Bavarian king. Um, it's worth remembering that Greek cultural production at this time didn't just come to an end. Um, so what I mean by that is music, literature, painting and dance did not cease during this time. It continued in vernacular forms. In other words, aside from the mainstream ancient high art forms which appealed to the colonizing Bavarians, um, two schools of modern Greek literature exemplify the assertion and emergence of, of modern Greek culture. And I think it's significant that these two literary trends are sometimes called schools, because as schools, there were groups of cultural producers, groups of writers, working more or less independently, but following a kind of shared agenda. Um, and the, the, first Athen, the first Athenian school drew strongly on, on Hellenistic roots of modern Greece, which appealed to the colonizing Bavarians. So this is a, a school of literature. And, um, Alexandros Rizos Rangavis is recognised as one of the key figures here. He was educated in Bavaria, trained in the Bavarian uh, German-speaking army, and he was also an exponent of what's called Katharevusa. Um, that's a stylized Greek language of the educated classes, which was a, adopted grammatical features from classical Greek uh, to strengthen the link between modern Greece and the ancient Greek Hellenic world. And of course, it was, this language was favored by the German colonizers because they were interested in, in the ancient Greek. So the book shown here is a translation of Plutarch's parallel lives into 19th century Katharevusa Greek. So it's translated from ancient, early uh, Greek into modern, or not very modern Greek. Um, this first school was followed by the, what's called the New Athenian School, in which the emphasis shifted from Katharevusa to um, and the exclusive glorification of, of um, the Hellenic world towards a literature and language committed to the people of modern Greece. So the New Athenian School was associated with the use of Demotic Greek, that's the vernacular language, um, spoken by most Greeks at the time and right up to the present day. The leading figure in this movement was Kostis Palamas, lived from 1859 to 1943. And this work is about modern Greek heroes who fought against the Ottomans. So a different, a shift of emphasis in the content as well as in the language. Anyway, the arguably pro-Bavarian pseudo-Hellenic Katharevusa Greek language didn't catch on and it's now virtually died out, although it was taught in schools for, for a long time. 
Modern Greek literature uses demotic Greek, the dominant position to emerge from the so-called Greek language question, which for a time defined the field of literary production in, in Greece. And one of the most significant twists um, in, in this story that, that we're telling you in the Greek-German relationship, and it's almost the final twist in our version of the story, comes from a Tyrolean traveller and cultural historian, Jakob Philipp Falmaraya, who lived from 1790 to 1861. In a two-volume treatise published in the 1830s, so after the independence, Falmaraya argued that the modern Greeks were not really linked to their ancient Greek ancestors at all. Their blood had been contaminated by racial mixing with the Turks and others. If anyone had a right to claim pure racial and spiritual lineage with a Hellenic culture, so his argument goes, it was the modern emerging German nation. Um, this counter-narrative was seized upon by Hitler and developed by Nazi racial theorists for whom ancient Greece represented an ideal of Indo-European or Indo-German Aryan purity, while the modern Greeks were one among many inferior races uh, on the list for domination and destruction. Um, the physical and symbolic violence against the modern Greeks resonates into and beyond World War II, the Greek Civil War, and the anti-communist junta, and right up to those aggressive populist images we showed you at the beginning of the presentation. So we can see that the historical German-Greek cultural entanglement was characterized by socially divisive tensions, like the Greek language question, and, and that it culminated in a violent and traumatic rupture we wanted to find a vocabulary, a conceptual frame to help us map out these conflicts and to explore where German-Greek relations stand from a cultural perspective today. And that's where we think the sociology of Pierre Bourdieu is most helpful. For example, it's from Bourdieu that we borrow terms like cultural capital, symbolic capital, symbolic violence, and the idea of a dynamically self-structuring field of cultural production. And that's it from me. Over to Kelly. Thank you. Um, you can hear me now? Yep. So what we hope to have emerged so far is that ideas are not just simply transplanted into a new foreign culture without the discovery, intervention, and even manipulation of others, and usually domestic uh, thinkers. So the transfer, therefore, um, of works is rarely uh, innocent, but rather involves the pursuit of some sort of profit. Now, that profit could be monetary, could be aesthetic, ideological, uh, it could take any uh, form. For that reason, we think that a sociological approach to cross-cultural transfer, one that, for example, looks at all the agents involved, so who does the selecting, um, how work is translated, what sort of strategies uh, are employed, uh, are parts removed, uh, or how a given work is positioned in uh, its receiving culture through, for instance, a preface, is very, very telling. And we turn to Bourdieu, who says, and I quote, that intellectual life, like all other social spaces, is a home to nationalism and imperialism. And intellectuals, like everyone else, constantly peddle prejudices, stereotypes, received ideas, and hastily simplistic representations. And then he moves on explicitly addressing cross-cultural uh, transfer to say that with authors, with foreign authors, it's not what they say, but what they can be made to say. And this is of great interest, and perhaps that's where we should be looking in order to see and understand how cultural transfer uh, works. So very briefly, Bourdieu systematized his take on how ideas travel into a three-stage uh, model. So the first stage is selection, which involves what sort of texts are selected by whom, 
who gets to publish them and translate them. Classification um, involves uh, how works are interpreted and, and uh, classified, how they are packaged. Uh, the reading stage involves the critics and the, um, the readership's uh, perception, understanding and reception of a given work. And to that we also add translation, which involves the textual transfer of a given uh, text. Um, so the translation strategy is employed, which could vary from slavish reproduction to radical intervention. Now, transfer can be instigated by a single individual. Uh, there have been cases in which authors have been fascinated by foreign, other foreign authors and have taken it upon themselves to introduce them to a foreign uh, re uh, readership. Uh, to medium um, uh, size entities such as publishing houses or universities, or they could also be part of uh, state uh, wide uh, cultural campaigns, as was the appropriation of ancient Greek thought by um, uh, Nazi Germany, as uh, we have seen so far and we'll see uh, further. So, uh, just to give you an example of how uh, works are appropriated and woven into deviant sometimes, uh, national, cultural, or other narratives. So, in Nazi Germany, a statewide campaign was implemented to isolate and promote um, uh, Hellenism as detached from its recent history. So, let's not forget Greece had ancient Greek had uh, Greece, sorry, um, had, had been dominated by uh, the Romans, uh, then there was uh, uh, Byzantium, then uh, um, the Ottomans up until modernity. Um, so Nazi Germany um, detached uh, Hellenism from that part of, their, uh, of our history and wove ancient Greek thought into the narrative of the Indo-Germanic uh, cultural identity. So appropriating it as Germanic ancestral culture. So what you see on the slide is a very telling example of this. This is a publication, uh, Death and Immortality, um, uh, uh, published by the Do Deutsches Annenerbe, which was an SS think tank established by, um, uh, by Himmler in order to promote Hitler's racial uh, doctrines. So in this uh, collection, this is an 80 page long uh, pamphlet which features 11 texts from antiquity, ancient Greece and uh, Latin works um, alongside uh, other uh, works, for example, philo uh, German philosophical works such as that of uh, Nietzsche. Um, so in other words, ancient Greek thought is selected, translated and also classified in a way that allows Nazi uh, Germany to claim patrimony uh, of such philosophical achievements, as the, as the subtitle suggests, from Indo-Germanic wisdom. Um, apart from the specific works that have been selected here, also a particular part of the Greek identity selected and promoted, um, that is Hellenism. Now, um, at the same time, there are competing tendencies to this isolation of the Greek identity, of the uh, Hellenic part of the Greek identity, However, they could be said to be stifled, so not as vocal as uh, um, uh, that of the film uh, Hellenes. Um, so this quote from Karl Dietrich is uh, very telling of this tendency. Um, I'm not a film Hellene, but a friend of Greeks, Greek friendly, because I appreciate modern Greeks for what they actually are, and not as descendants of the Hellenes, because I'm interested in the living, not the dead. Phil Hellenism was the wet nurse of the speechless child of newborn Greece. But now that Greece has learned to speak and to walk, it needs no wet nurses and no caresses, but good, exacting educators to guide it to rigor and kindness. So this Greek point here in the German is very uh, powerful, I think. It's a recognition of a valid cultural and national um, uh, identity in contemporary Europe, but also uh, it gives a uh, the, the peoples of a fledgling new uh, state uh, in Europe at that point, uh, flesh and bone, so to speak. So I see this as a sort of turning point in the German conception of uh, Greece, um, an acceptance of uh, Greek identity as an amalgamation of Hellenism and uh, uh, Romeo Sini, so modern Greekness. 
This is not, of course, a very dominant narrative uh, of Greekness in the European imagination and uh, the German one at that. Now, we see that Greeks struggle with this from very, very early on. So, um, as this emerges from uh, this quote here from uh, a letter, uh, Greek poet Yanis Kambisis wrote to Karl Dietrich. The weight of my ancestors is very, very heavy. Even the name crushes me like a mountain, like Olympus. I'm not free at all, and I'm condemned to be their slave forever. I can do nothing because I'm Euripides' descendant. I weep because I'm the unworthy descendant of the great ancestors. Tear down history, tear up the books, bury the tradition so that I may become a little alive, so that I may breathe a little, so that, I'm, that I also become a piece of man so that they also look at me and say, he's the Romnios. Oh, that am I no longer here, that he's the descendant of the Hellenes. So this bipolar of being a Hellene, uh, weighed down by the great greatness of the ancestors, and that of being a Romnios, a cultural palimpsest of various peoples, uh, mixture of ancient Greek, Balkan, Byzantine, and so on, leads to a sort of schizophrenic identity for modern Greeks. And indeed, I think the legacy of the Philhellenes, um, how Greece was interpreted and consumed as a symbol in Europe and in Germany, wore down on Greeks. And those Philhellenes that actually joined the, the cause uh, of war independence, well, first of all, most of them were brutally uh, uh, murdered uh, in the a battalion of the Philhellenes. Um, but those of them who survived were really disillusioned. Uh, you can imagine they probably expected to encounter ancient Greek philosophers uh, philosophizing, and reality was far distant. Um, so uh, this becomes evident uh, in uh, Haro Haring's writings. Uh, Haro Haring was a German Philhellenes. By the way, most of the Philhellenes who fought in uh, Greece were Germans. Um, whereby he describes Greeks as sunken people and depraved uh, Greeks. So there's this disappointment in Europe and in Germany of what Greece, the Hellenes were, which feeds into modern day. And I think the epitome of which we saw at the beginning uh, with the, um, uh, the image from the cover of Focus magazine, which now sort of reads like a criticism of uh, Greeks not being able to carry the weight of the splendor of their ancestors. And this seems to inform Germany's cultural relationship up to a certain extent uh, to Greece. Now, um, indeed, Greece is a marginal uh, culture in, uh, in uh, Europe and in modern day Germany, which is of interest to us. Um, and its literature even more so if you look at the uh, numbers of translations taking place from modern Greece into German. So this data has been taken from UNESCO's Index Translationum, which shows that uh, if you compare modern Greek to ancient Greek, you'll see that translations from ancient Greek into German is quadruple that of modern Greek. And then if you look at English, it really puts things into uh, perspective. So um, how limited translational activities from modern Greek into German are. Now, you see, probably modern Greek doesn't even you know, uh, appear on the graph. Um, despite the small numbers, however, uh, there is a gradual shift in uh, Germany from Philhellenes to what we have identified as and call Romeophiles, so Greek, modern Greek enthusiasts, and an acceptance of, of the modern Greek thought and contemporary uh, Greek uh, culture. Of course, like I said, um, Greek literature is marginal, and as Milona states here, you see on your slide, on the occasion of Greece being the honored country of the Frankfurt Book Fair in 2001, um, as, as uh, literary producers, we are not so well known because we are not good enough. We also couldn't be because we have no tradition, no culture, we have no system to write, we hold no tools of the writer in our hands and so on. So due to historical, cultural, uh, political and social factors, uh, Greek literature lagged in comparison to more 
dominant uh, literatures in, uh, in uh, Europe, such as uh, French, German, and English. So even today, we would see that the classics, um, uh, ancient Greek texts, have a very different fate, so greater uh, visibility. Now, this lag is both in terms of actual production, so what is produced in Greece uh, currently um, uh, in literature, but also in terms of cross-cultural exchanges, so what is uh, translated. However, in the case of Germany, 1982 for us is a relative turning point with the foundation of, uh, with the founding of Romeo Sinica Lag in Kong. Um, slowly and particularly after 2001, because of the Frankfurt Book Fair, many more efforts are uh, made with publishers such as Reinecke und Voss, uh, Elfenbein and so on, uh, really investing a lot in their uh, 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 agenda uh, of uh, uh, publishing more Greek literature, contemporary Greek literature. Now, Romeo Sinifalak, however, is the most important um, uh, effort. Uh, which, as the name suggests, is an effort to rehabilitate uh, modern Greece in the eyes of the German public. Um, and it does so through a very intensive translational uh, project. So the name Ram Yusin is very symbolic because um, it echoes, uh, I don't know if you are acquainted with Yanis Ritsos, one of the most famous uh, poets of uh, Greece. So it echoes um, his poem Ram Yusin, but also it resonates with uh, modern Greeks who see their identity uh, as a mixture of ancient Greek and Byzantine elements. So similar to Phil Hellenes, there are individuals in this network who accept, engage with, and promote uh, this part of modern Greek identity. So apart from the big publishers, uh, such as Diogenes and uh, Suoka, who might offer more commercially um, uh, safe uh, works, there are uh, some in individuals involved in the project Modern Green Literature, which we call Romeo Fils, and who really go out there and do uh, a lot to uh, translate and promote Modern Greek uh, Literature. Now, just so we have a better understanding, you've heard Romeo Fils and Romeo Sini a lot today. So, uh, it comes from the noun Romeos, um, which means, historically, a citizen of the Roman Empire, especially during the Byzantine period, and a speaker of Greek. Uh, historically an Orthodox Christian during the post-Byzantine era of the Turcogradia, during the 19th century, a modern Greek who has preserved the Orthodox tradition of Byzantium, as distinct from an advocate of the European Enlightenment, with ironic force, a type of modern Greek characterized by Greeks themselves in disparaging terms as servile towards power, lazy, conniving, or gullible, as opposed to the idealized model of the Hellene of classical anti antiquity. So, um, this bipolar Hellene Romeos represents an identity state of ambivalence between antiquity and modernity, which, however, for me, captures the fragmentation. Um, of the history of Greece, from antiquity, uh, Roman conquest, Byzantium, and so on. So our understanding of Romeophiles are those who accept and celebrate in the cultural and memory makeup of modern Greece, its contemporary identity. Now, um, as David said, uh, we've only just begun investigating um, this area. But in our research so far, we encountered a very active network uh, of such Romeophiles, uh, who consist of German individuals, Greeks or uh, Greek-German individuals, who very often collaborate with one another to uh, familiarize the German readership of modern Greek uh, literature. Some examples of these Romeophiles are Hans and Niki Eidenaya. Hans Eidenaya uh, is a professor of modern Greek, and his wife Niki, uh, Dirk, Uwe Hansen, a uh, professor of ancient Greek, but a translator of modern Greek uh, poetry and also publisher. Uh, Elena Palanza and Mikaela Plinziger, uh, very active translators. And we claim that their efforts can no be seen uh, as um, uh, cultural activism. For instance, much like the Philhellenes of the 19th century who um, uh, donated their fortune to the Greek uh, independence cause or who um, who used uh, their resources to come and join the war, 
Um, Hans Ardenaya founded Romeo Sino Verlag after he came into uh, some inheritance money and poured it all in the uh, publishing house. Uh, Dirk Hansen um, also came uh, upon a little inheritance and poured it into the uh, uh, Greek uh, literature agenda of their uh, publishing house, uh, Reine und Voss. Um, all of these individuals also employ what could be termed as activist means of promoting literature. Uh, so Elena Palenzai and Niki Aydenai at, at very different times engaged for their students outside teaching hours to translate modern Greek literature and very uh, often got, got it published. Um, they also maintain blogs, they translate uh, uh, poems or parts of uh, uh, Greek fiction uh, into German and promote it online. So uh, this is why we see these efforts as falling in the broader spectrum of cultural activism. There are times, however, when this Romneyfield take might directly clash with what can be seen as a more hegemonic or colonial approach to Greece as the following um, anecdotes suggest. So, um, uh, in about a year before uh, George Seferis uh, won the Nobel Prize uh, for Literature, uh, Christian Enzensberger, who was a German uh, professor of English studies, had translated his work. So, uh, Hans Seidenaya, who was a very enthusiast, uh, enthusiastic student of uh, modern Greek at that point, found out that uh, Christian Enzensberger lived very close to him. So he, he was very enthusiastic, he went to meet him, and uh, as he was talking to him, he realized, and I, I quote, that this scoundrel actually didn't want to admit that he translated the work from English and didn't know a word of Greek, without acknowledgement whatsoever. So when he confronted him, uh, when Hans confronted uh, uh, him, he just kicked him out, and that was the end uh, of the story. Uh, Would we see this as a sort of symbolic usurpation whereby a more culturally dominant translator um, ascribing low prestige to modern Greek as linguistic capital, just casually translated from English without uh, acknowledging so. And of course, as Idenaya suggests here, uh, this is often the fate of more peripheral uh, literatures, uh, whose linguistic capital does not enjoy a lot of prestige in the world republic of uh, letters. However, what Idenaya did, we think, is a form of defiance here. Uh, and a very funny anecdote, I think. Um, apart from those more activist uh, efforts, there are more sanctioned efforts, so to speak, uh, to promote uh, modern Greek literature in Germany, the most important of which is the Centrum Modernes Griechenland, in, uh, housed by um, the Freie Universität in Berlin, which took over the publishing activities of uh, Romeosini Verlag um, uh, into and renamed it into Edition Romeosini. Um, and what it does is make all these works freely available in German uh, online. Uh, but it's also very involved in uh, generating anthologies of contemporary works and to, in order to attract uh, other publishing houses because they don't want to substitute publishers, they want to um, genuinely familiarize the German uh, uh, publishers and the German readership with, uh, with Greek literature. So they envision themselves as a vector in the network of German and German Greek literary agents. Now, uh, before my colleague will conclude the uh, presentation, um, I add this quote here by Hans Eidenaya because I think it's very indicative here of, of his stance, but also the stance of a lot of uh, people involved uh, in, in uh, promoting modern Greek literature in Germany. Uh, in discussing Tachtsi's Totrito Stefani, the third wedding wreath, um, and, and his efforts to get it published in the 80s, he says that he really, he really insisted on getting it, he tried to get it published and he did in the end, that he, it just had to be there in German um, because it was world literature. So we see this as a concrete manifestation of an act to firmly mark the place of modern Greek uh, literary production in today's world republic of letters. Oh, you've got, yeah. Thank you. So just to sum up, 
the, um, the talk as a whole, this is going to be quite short, I promise. Um, summing up then, we can see a, po we see a positive parallel between modern Greek cultural activists that we've just been talking about and the 19th century Phil Hellenes. Greek and German cultural activists often volunteer their time and energy to illuminate and make the German public familiar with cultural activities from the intellectual margins of modern Greece. They invest their own symbolic, cultural and often economic capital. Um, uh, most of the 19th century German philhellenes and neoclassicists engaged in similar efforts to appropriate Greek culture and colonize Greece itself as the birthplace of European intellect, culture, and even democracy. Their interests were arguably primarily cultural rather than political or economic. Their motivation was at least partially integrative rather than disruptive and divisive. Um, I just wanted to go down. But there's another key difference the Philhellenes were striving to promote what was already widely accepted throughout Europe as a symbolically central people in the culture, the ancient Greeks. The stakes and the dynamics of the field have changed radically since the 19th century. Many cultural activities now take place at the margins of Greek society, and modern Greekness tends to be promoted through a different kind of, of um, colonial outlook. Greece is advertised as a space for sunshine and holidays, a colonial space uh, in, the scene that, uh, in the sense that places are selected to serve specific monocultural and again arguably populist purposes. Um, the dialogue coming up on screen now um, is something that uh, brings a final ironic twist one of the German publishers we interviewed told us about this conversation which took place recently between an enthusiastic student and an established German authority on Greek literature. Um, do you go to Greece on your holidays? And the answer was, no, why would I want to go to Greece? Uh, he answered in disgust, Greece is a construct of the intellect. <laughs> So you can see that there's still work, cultural and memory work, to be done to rehabilitate or retranslate the image of Greek culture in Germany and Europe, and possibly to heal some of the wounds. That's it. <laughs>